It was the summer of 1916, and life seemed good. It was hot, one of the hottest summers on record. Beach bathing was now all the rage. Bigger than the bicycle. Even bigger than the horseless carriage. Across the ocean, they were fighting a war, but nobody really thought we'd get caught up in it. Right off our own coast, German U-boats prowled the waters, looking for a kill. But that wasn't our problem. New York, Philly, Boston, were all facing a polio epidemic. Mothers were desperate to get their kids out of town to our beaches, where the air was fresh and clean. Then, out of nowhere, our own local crisis hit. It took us by surprise, and it knocked us for a loop. In some, it brought out the best. In others, well... That summer was hard. The hardest of my life. It started in July with those hot, sunny days. And if you were anywhere near the Jersey Shore, all you could think about was getting out of the heat and into that cool, cool water. From the haunted heartland in Omaha, Nebraska, my name is Brian Corey, and I welcome you to this episode of the Necronomicast. For tonight's late night conversation, I'm going to take you back in time to July 1916, a time when World War I loomed over America and New York City was in the midst of a deadly polio epidemic. The tri-state area sought relief at the Jersey Shore. The Atlantic Ocean's refreshing waters proved to be dangerous, however. In just 12 days, four swimmers were violently and fatally mauled in separate shark attacks, and a fifth swimmer escaped an attack within inches of his life. In his thoroughly researched account, Dr. Richard Fernicola, the leading expert on the attacks, presents a riveting portrait, investigation, and scientific analysis of the terrifying days against the colorful backdrop of America in 1916 in his book, 12 Days of Terror. And now joining us on the Necronomicast hotline, from the banks of the Matawan Creek, the author of 12 Days of Terror, Dr. Richard Fernicola. Richard, how you doing? How you doing, Brian? Nice to uh, be with uh, you this evening. And I must correct you, however, I am on the uh, Jersey Shore <laughs> section of New Jersey, central New Jersey, on the shore of the Gold Coast, so to speak, you know, more or less the epicenter uh, topic or uh, geographically to the uh, 1916 attacks, I suppose. So I guess that's why I'm here this evening. Yes, well, yes. As we draw closer, I have been to the banks of the Matawan Creek. Sorry, I've got you off, but yes, go ahead. Sorry. No, yes. no. I was just as, as the calendar as we get ready to flip the calendar over to July. I was telling you earlier that one of my favorite movies, probably my favorite movie, my favorite movie is Jaws, and I've talked about it a lot on this podcast with different kinds of, oh, different kinds of people, uh, paranormal people. Um, true crime authors just uh, brought up Jaws and the, the 1916 shark attacks. But to have you on the program with your definitive work on the 1916 New Jersey shark attacks, to have you on the program, what a treat and what an honor. I'm so excited for this conversation. Well, good. thank you for that uh, buildup. I, uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I, I suppose when you, you speak of accolades in reference to 1916 text, you're talking about the, the story itself. And, and but uh, yes, I do. Uh, as far as a historical event, I do put it in that uh, ethical uh, category, just as Jaws is, even though Jaws is fictional uh, and, and we all love it for the sensational aspects. Uh, and and I actually am old enough to have seen it in the theaters as a lifeguard, a young lifeguard, and so on and so forth. So it hits, you know, major, major league to uh, you know, us in this area. But, but yes, I include the 1916 attacks in that category, so to speak. Sure. Sure. Uh, I've read a lot of uh, documentation. Uh, I've read a few accounts of, of, the, of the 1916 attacks by uh, other authors, and I've also read um, Shark Attack by David Baldridge and the Victor Koppelson uh, edition also of Shark Attack. Uh, I read those just for pleasure, just out of my own research and fun of my love of sharks, I guess, as much love of sharks as I can have in Omaha, Nebraska. The, <laughs> I'm about as far away from a, from the ocean as you can get. But when I came across your book and I read it, I was getting 
just the full picture that I've always wanted, not only just the historical aspects of what happened during those days in, in July of 1916, but just so much American history in there, what was going on and leading up to World War I. And also just there's there's tons of detective work that you've done through there. And what's incredible to me, maybe not to you, but to me, you wrote this fantastic book, the scientific slash historical book, but you are also, you're a doctor, you're, you're an MD doctor. Uh, and I, and I, I think that's incredible that, um, that, that you've written this, uh, wonderful book that a historian might, might write or, or a scientist might write, but, but, uh, but a, uh, MD fantastic. Well, thank you very much, uh, again, for that, that, that background, uh, capsule. And, and I do have to say, uh, it, it does help to be a physician in reference to applying that to the analysis, for sure, for sure. And incidentally, I do consider uh, myself as a physician to be a scientist, believe it or not. <laughs> right. But uh, but uh, yet, yeah, no, I have, uh, you know, I, I've lived on the shore my entire life, essentially. So you, you have the fishing and the scuba diving and the uh, snorkeling, you know, I even had a, a you know long span of very intensive uh, shipwreck diving uh, in there as well, and so on and so forth. So when you put that together with a love of history, and I, you know, haven't mentioned how I necessarily got into that, but uh, uh, you, you add a love of history into that, and then you know it's kind of made to order in reference to investigating uh, this uh, kind of a scarcely. Uh, investigated uh, series of attacks, in my opinion. And it, and I would love to know uh, those books you mentioned, the Copelson book and Baldrige, if you had actually read them before you knew about my book. Oh, yes. Yes. In fact, yeah, I, I said that that's incredible. You know, there you go. Those were very inspirational to me as a kid, you know, going to the public library and seeing those books. And obviously, Victor Copelson, as you know, is a, uh, a MD as well, mm -hmm. uh, a physician. Uh, that was inspirational uh, to me as well. But uh, thanks for that correlation. Sure. Yeah, I was a big reader when I was a kid and my parents just kind of threw books at me and I read them uh, and saved up money to buy used paperbacks. And I bought David Baldry's book uh, in Minnesota when we were on a family vacation. I read it one summer. I was probably 12 or 13. It was a hard book for a 12 or 13 year old to read. But I just all the cases that were in there, like the shark arm case, for example, and all these other cases that were in there. Incredible. And the the Coppelson book I bought, oh, maybe a couple of years before that, when we were on a trip, I bought it in a bookstore when we were going to British Columbia uh, on a family vacation. And so these books have been around in my library for for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've watched Jaws a million times. The Benchley book is a favorite of mine, great book. Uh, but, you know, it's referenced the 1916 attacks. And so when I started digging into history and, and reading more about these attacks, and I came across your book, you just laid it out in such scientific and wonderful terms. And also, just like I said, with the history of World War I coming of age, everything else happening, you really put the reader into 1916 to let the, the person know exactly what it was like to be there on the Jersey Shore at Beach Haven, you know, when these things started off back in 1916. So when you were writing this book or when you came up with the idea to come up with this book, how long did this research take you? How much of your life did you devote to putting this book together? Well, to be honest with you, I, I became interested in it, uh, you know, kind of at the same time as, as you did, so to speak, at least subliminally when you heard, uh, you know, those guys, uh, you know, Roy Scheider and uh, Richard Dreyfus on the beach saying, you know, it happened in 1916, you know, you know, five people eating up on the beach and this and that and so on and so, you know, that kind of rung in my head. Maybe about 10 years later, I, you know, ran into uh, a, a, a local uh, waterman, we call them, so to speak, you know, water mavens, and uh, had mentioned the attack and more, those attacks in more detail. And then I, and then I uh, you know, it, then it, it snowballed from there. But this was really uh, late, late high school, believe it or not, in college that I started, uh, you know, getting more into that. And, and, I, and uh, I guess I put it together a self published version. Uh, of uh, 12 Days of Terror, which was called In Search of the Jersey Maneater, uh, probably, I, I believe, before I even, uh, I think in 1990, yeah, 1990, so that was uh, before I even graduated from medical school. 
Uh, and then things, uh, believe it or not, from there, for just from that uh, version uh, of, of the history, the scientific analysis, the, the, a Discovery Channel, uh, now a famous uh, uh, producer on the Discovery Channel, the Shark Week uh, version, uh, did a, uh, a, a, a devoted 15 minutes to the story, you know, off of that uh, self-published book. And then, you know, things, you know, kind of lit up uh, from there and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, I've also watched uh, the the Twelve Days of Terror kind of a movie adaptation that came out what, like two thousand four or five. Is that when that came out? Around that, yeah, around that time, yeah. And you were uh, heavily involved in that production. I was one of the reporters in oh. the uh, in the you know the the, con- the you know the press conference scene. Yeah, I was there and so on and so forth. Yeah, I you know no, let, let me be quite honest. You know, uh, I, I don't think any author has a, a book made. Not many are, are necessarily pleased with some adaptation, and I didn't right. have a major uh, hand in, in, in decision making. Um, you know, because there's always adaptations and modifications. I, I, I would have made some changes, but I'm, I'm still glad it, it made it at least to the small screen uh, in, in that people, you know, certainly know more about the Jersey Shore and the attacks. And they can go from there and search out other books if they want to know, you know more of the scientific angle on it. Richard, let's let's kind of let's bring the the uh, listener if they're not familiar with the story. Let's kind of bring them into 1916 and, let, and let's let's talk about. The, the beginning of the attacks, uh, it was July, very hot. The culture of the time, people were just starting to get into recreational swimming and the, the communities there at Beach Haven, and they uh, started really catering to this new tourism of people going to the ocean and cooling off. And, and we had polio going on at the same time too. That was all part of it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't live back then, and I, and uh, and I know you didn't either, for sure. <laughs> but uh, right. uh, and in reference to uh, you know getting back uh, to the context, and, and and you you really extended the most uh, favorable compliment when you said you felt like you were kind of back in that time. And when I hear that kind of uh, uh, compliment in reference to you know feeling like oh I I, I, I you know you gave the you know the, the background where you could actually feel that you're there and maybe even smell it or something but uh, when i hear that from a local you know a local you know kind of in my category local historian or whatnot mm-hmm. who has lived here it really uh it's re- it's really fantastic but in reference to that time it was a uh, kind of that uh, the waning aspect of uh, that uh, golden innocent uh, age you know we had not gotten into world war one we had not gotten into World War One as yet as a as a nation. It would be about another year, and uh, it, it, yeah, and we just entered the uh, so so called uh, an era where era where we had leisure time, you know, because of uh, the way uh, j- you know the job industry, industrial revolution, and so on and so forth. So we were doing more leisurely things, especially on weekends and things. Believe it or not, that was new and uh, in- inclusive of that prior to. Um, yeah, air conditioning and so so on and so forth. Uh, the 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 shore breezes were just absolutely uh, spectacularly refreshing when you get the southeast breeze after twelve one o'clock in the afternoon here. You know, in the northeast, uh, it, it's just the only place to be. But people would even believe it or not after uh, a- after sundown after they ate they would all. You know, all head to the beach again. I actually I know this, but they would they would do that. You know, and have bonfires. You know, essentially everyone. So, uh, but in 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 those days, yes, the tourists were of an upper uh, upper class, so to speak. You know, it was more like getting on a passenger ship going to these beachside hotels uh, and the different table settings for dinner and all that kind of thing. And the train, the the convenience of trains was just absolutely magnificent. And uh, probably the cleanliness about them was was fantastic, and and the cushioning, the private cars, and and, and so uh, Charles Van Zant and 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 that, that you know the first attack victim, he was among them, you know the Philadelphians. So if you were a Philadelphian, you you wanted to escape to the shore, you you know you'd head to the uh, South Jersey Shore, that Beach Haven area by train. If you were a New Yorker or North New Jersey. Uh, individual, you, you might, you know, head to the, the, the northern aspect of the Jersey Shore, 
know, starting Sandy Hook down and so on and so forth. Matawan isn't necessarily included in the Jersey Shore. It's more of a Bayside uh, community, Bayshore uh, community. But, but yeah, it was luxurious. But the, it goes well beyond uh, the luxury and leisure time and dressing nicely in the trades. You, you, the the upper crust, you, you know, you had Donald Trump uh, here, believe it or not, in the Jersey Shore to meet, uh, who had uh, met up with the, a family named Kushner uh, uh, and right on Ocean Avenue here in Elbron, Long Branch, which is, you know, a stone's throw uh, from me here, you know, in the Asbury Park area. And but that is zero new. That is nothing new. We had we, we had seven presidents, uh, including Woodrow Wilson, who actually had his summer White House here uh, in Long Branch, right on the Jersey Shore in that uh, 1916 summer. So that's kind of the echelon. You had hangers on, you know, with the politicians. But it, it was really uh, an extraordinary time, even to see the old postcards and photographs are, uh, are breathtaking. But people would promenade on the boardwalk with the parasols and their fine clothing, and uh, and that was essentially the setting. And with that, you mentioned him just a second ago, Charles Van Sant. He's a 23-year-old man, um, graduated- 25. 25, yes. excuse me. See, I got the expert on here. Uh, Charles Van Sant, he's a, a broker. I'll correct you when I can. <laughs> Go for it, man. So uh, he's a broker, uh, graduated recently from the University of Pennsylvania, a man that has a, like an upwardly mobile trajectory in life, He's going to accomplish great things in his life. And then he goes out for that fateful day. He goes out for a swim, a strong swimmer, and goes out that afternoon of July 1st at Beach Haven, and he succumbs to the attack of, of a shark. And at the time, I was reading through your book, at the time they weren't necessarily sure it was a shark. I mean, there's all kinds of theories from snapping turtles to German U-boats to... to you know, all kind of propellers, everything almost but the shark being the culprit of this gruesome, horrible attack. Yeah. So in that historical setting, that the buildup uh, or backdrop we were talking about before, inclusive in that is the fact that uh, for 100 years, essentially, uh, you know, post uh, post Revolutionary War, post Civil War and so on and so forth, when when people started to swim or at least, you know, uh, do doggy paddle around their uh, ships or something like that. Uh, there really was zero threat uh, from any kind of marine creature uh, other than jellyfish or something like that. Uh, you know, so essentially it was an area that was completely safe and sure down below North Carolina and the tropics, you know, you hear anecdotal reports about, you know, some you know shark attacking near where they're you know throwing away uh oh full of refuse or something like that mm -hmm. uh fish guts and so on and so forth. but you know up, up north of uh cape hatteras you wouldn't necessarily be worried about anything attacking you in the water uh and we don't have killer whales either uh in this vicinity we have other whales for sure but uh but yeah th there wouldn't be any necessarily any threat so that's where you had Charles Van Zandt that Saturday uh, afternoon gets a late train from Philadelphia with his sister and his dad, who was an otolaryngologist and ear, nose and throat surgeon. Uh, so he was definitely, you know, that upper crust uh, area, uh, you, know, look, you know, from Sp Spruce Street in Philadelphia and all that. And uh, incidentally, he was of uh, one of the, uh, you know, those pioneering uh uh, uh, lines, one of the, you know, the earliest uh, Americans that came in the uh, early 1600s or, or middle 1600s, something with that Dutch uh, influx. Uh, be that as it may, uh, he uh, went out for a swim. He was, he, he and his family were going to have, you know, maybe the seven o'clock dinner setting at the, uh, uh, the hotel, Angleside Hotel. And uh, he, he, you know, wanted to get in there. He was a proficient swimmer, as you mentioned, a great, you know, great athlete in uh, you know, high school and college and uh, went out there, you know, more or less alone, no, no reports necessarily was in the water with anything other than with anyone other than a dog. And he, he was out maybe 50 yards. So beyond the breakers and he was shouting for the dog uh, to come out and, and, and play it, you know, and swim out, uh, you know, uh, beyond uh, leg level and so on and so forth. And by reports, people saw a fin, a dark fin, slicing 
towards him, behind him. And according to reports, he turned around, saw it and started, uh, you know, making way for uh, for sure uh, with whatever, you know, kind of stroke. Uh, he wouldn't necessarily perform maybe freestyle, but probably more akin to fast uh, breaststroking or something. And uh, and, and uh, he, he was struck as he was trying to get toward sure. Yeah, he was struck. It's like you said, he was he was calling for a dog. People were playing and not, you know, just having a great afternoon. Um, and this Finn comes, strikes, and he's rescued by a lifeguard, Alexander Ott. Now, in your book, you were able to interview, was it the grandson of Alexander Ott? His son. His son. His son. His was, son. His son. So he's rescued, yes. uh, pulled ashore. And the, the, he was mutilated. I mean, the, the wounds were catastrophic to him, severed this mutilated. You know, I mean, you're the doctor, you can, <laughs> you know, well, the- you know, you know, you know, by, by reports and, and the reason I mentioned certain reports, because I actually can back them up. So to, so to speak by mm-hmm. wound uh, analysis, but uh, so the reports say that this fit was, uh, uh, you know, targeting him approaching from the ocean side uh, here uh, on the uh, east side so to speak and he'd be trying to get toward shore toward the west uh, frantically and and sure enough there was a, a gash in the front of his left leg but where excuse me on the front of his right leg but where he got this this mauling and it's it, it, it's something you you know you know baldridge's book and, and you know copelson's and and if you've examined some of the other shark attack uh uh injury is you know i can describe it it's very you're probably very aware of it, but the, so as he, he he's trying to get away from this shark, but as he's trying to get away, he's doing you know, a flutter kick, so to speak, or maybe even trying to touch the sand uh, to get traction. Uh, you know, testing whether he's in waist deep, chest deep water, uh, or whatnot. Sure enough, that uh, left leg wound was really on the posterior. It was. And I actually have some subtle errors in, in the in the books about this because I reread the, the positions for it. It was on the, more on the back and interior, more toward the uh, let's say the male area, uh, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, where he was actually trying to. And that shark came as as was described, came from the rear and interior, uh, but it essentially took out everything other than the opposite side that lunate that crescent shape uh uh a uh, uh, avulsion i can't even say it as an incision laceration or whatever you want to call it because it went fully fully down the bone whereas his dad you know you know ultimately got on the beach to help out as a surgeon and, and he and he he said the, the leg almost looked like it was almost torn off uh you know that's how you know far there's almost nothing left it's almost uh it's almost unimaginable uh, when you see that, but that's what that uh, shark did, and and obviously, and, you know, they got a tourniquet on it. And, you know, there's a medical student as well on the beach, and Alexander Ott tore a woman's uh, coat, uh, dress hem, and and made a tourniquet out of it right away. So you had you no know, fast acting guys. You couldn't have anything better, you know, than that even today necessarily uh, in reference to that basic stuff. Uh, but he died, you know, a short time later uh, from the blood loss and shock. Yeah. And he's dragged up on the beach and his family saw all this taking place. Like the dramatic parts for me, the human parts for me are, are just so frightening when he's brought up and they're trying to trying to render aid. They're trying to figure out how to get him to a hospital, how they're trying to transport him away from the beach. They bring him inside the Ingleside Hotel and they clear off the manager's desk and they and they lay this this mutilated swimmer on top of there just at the end of his life. And he just bleeds to death and dies there on the desk of the Ingleside motel, roughly six forty five or so in the evening, just in front of everybody. It's just, just so gruesome and, and awful. Yeah. Horrendous. You know, the, the doctors, uh, the hotel doctor and the local doctors did not think he could make the, you know, the buggy ride, so to speak, uh, to the, to the hospital, you know, would have no shot, but just imagine this. No one thinks, Sharks are a threat. No one even really knows what a shark even looks like up close. And here, your guy have a this uh, virile, uh, handsome young guy uh, coming out of the water, dragged out of the water, and has a wound on him that no one, no one even today would, you know, be able to stomach. Uh, literally, uh, 
uh, uh, so that, you know, it's quite amazing what they were exposed to, baptized to, so to speak. Yes. So all this goes on, this horrible tragedy happens, and this is the first time something like this has really kind of happened. It, it wasn't really reported heavily in terms of being like front page news right away, this first shark attack. It was on a, you know, a, a later page in the newspaper. Like I said, they did. They said they called it a fish that attacked him, might have bitten him. You know, he's come to a fish bite or something like that. Uh, so, the 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 terror didn't really strike the community so much as a few days later on July sixth, uh, when that second major attack happened near Spring Lake, New Jersey, when Charles Bruder, and he was a bell captain at the Essex and Sussex Hotel. Yeah, Charles Bruder was a twenty eight year old, a stocky uh, Swiss Swissman. Uh, as, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> you know, he, he had, uh, come to uh, America about, uh, I guess around eight years before, but he was still sending his mom, uh, you know, a portion of his check, uh, because his brother was, uh, fighting in the war, you know, in Europe. And, and he was, a he was probably the strongest swimmer of all the attack victims. Uh, quite honestly, this guy used to, you know, swim, you know, like 200 yards out and, and, you know, do do what he, whatever he wanted, stay in there, you know, even when it was, you know, quite chilly and, you know, had a good stroke. And he actually spent his winters out in California at the hotels there. So he was familiar with the, you know, the low 60s uh, degree waters and and even, you know, uh, boasted that he, he swam among blue, among blue charts out there and had no fear uh, of that. But uh, but, yeah, he used to take an afternoon break with the elevator uh, runner around uh, two o'clock in the afternoon at the hotel at the employee uh, section of the beach. You know, they had separate segregated sections for the employees and that kind of thing uh, in those days. But, you know, a little early than that, they used to have these different colored flags up for women and men uh, to go in, believe it or not. Men, men didn't need, need bathing suits, believe it or not, during the different flag times. <laughs> but in any event, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, Charles Bruder was out there a little after two, uh, a little bit around the, uh, the outgoing tide. It just started around a half hour before that. And uh, and something bumped him. And, uh, it, you know, ultimately, you know, a, a very, a very affluent, uh, famous woman, uh, Emma Childs, was up on the balcony of the Essex and Sussex and she saw and described, and and if I'm using the description, it, it means something. Uh, she said she saw a man, uh, first of all, they thought there was a red canoe that was capsized because there was a swath of uh, you know red water in the vicinity. But she said, in reference to the violence, to the impact, she she saw Charles Bruder actually tossed, tossed into the air uh, out of the water and screaming. You say, oh, that, that's just ridiculous. You know, but she, that's what she said. She saw and then she saw the shark, you know, coming back and forth. And sure enough, you know, that's, you know, the effect in reference to the uh, the injuries which this man sustained, which I'm sure you're uh, somewhat familiar with, that uh, essentially his legs just below the knees were essentially jagged and gone. Uh, there was, a, a you know, an apple-sized gash out of his stomach, another area uh, uh, excised below his, uh, his rib. Uh, and and even a gash above his uh, left leg, above his left knee. But he was essentially dead uh, in the bottom of the uh, lifeguard boat uh, sent out. You know, they 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 rowed out immediately uh, to tent. He said, "You know, shark bit me. You know, bit my legs off. You just you know, struggling to stay afloat." And they pulled him in. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, he's a, a lot lighter than they had imagined. You know, from the loss of tissue, bone, and and blood. Uh, and, and they get this guy, you know, on the beach, uh, in the boat. And you can imagine, uh, now you're talking about hundreds of people for some reason, even though it was a Saturday late afternoon there in beach and there weren't that, that many people who witnessed it and, and in reference to the account, sure. They squelched it locally. The Philadelphia papers did have it front page, but the local newspapers, because there's a question mark to it because of the atrocious nature of it, they did. Uh, try to just ignore it, so to speak. And, and you know, this is right before Fourth of July weekend, right? Fourth of July is, you know, the Fenton Van Zandt was attacked Saturday, 
or is last Tuesday. Now here we are Thursday for Charles Bruder in Spring Lake. Uh, not to mention you have the Secretary of the uh, Treasury, uh, who was also Woodrow Wilson's uh, son-in-law, coming to the Essex and Sussex uh, uh, for a uh, reception uh, with his wife uh, on uh, two to two days later. So uh, a lot of things were converging at this point. Yeah. Sure. And then I thought it was a nice uh, part that the the guests and the workers at the at the hotel, they raised money for Bruder's mother uh, in Switzerland because he was sending money to her like a good son would uh, to help her out and for him to be attacked. What a tragedy. And like you said, his his legs bitten off. I mean, these were this isn't just like, you know, a bite and, and you know, he got an infection. I mean, these were horrible, uh, tragic events that that just mutilated their their bodies and for me to as a musician not a doctor i can't even imagine i i've never seen anybody taken apart like that whether with a scalpel or an animal or anything like that i don't have any i don't have any background in any of that so i can only use what what i've seen in movies or in my own imagination as it's described to me but as a doctor when you're reading through these reports and you're seeing these these catastrophic injuries. Uh, I know you have to detach yourself, you know, as a, as a, as a physician, as a doctor, you know, to either render aid or to make diagnosis or something like that. But just from a, from a doctor's level, these, these injuries, when you're reading them, you just must be shaking your head like, Oh my God, I can't believe that the human body went through this. Yeah. I, you know, even if you were a seasoned EMT uh, emergency, uh, you know, you know, tech, uh, of that order, you know, you, you know, you're dealing with horrible uh, car accidents and things of that nature. The 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 odd avulsion of uh, you know tissue with these razor sharp uh, teeth uh, it, it, it is just uh, it, 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 I don't even know what word to describe it. But in regard to you know, you talk about the span of time. You're talking about July first and July sixth. Oh boy. You know this in, in the, these two shark, strange shark attacks in such a short span, say thirty miles north, thirty forty miles north, uh, uh, in, in that sequence of time. But then you add in the aspect you're talking about right now, the absolute, and we can't minimize it. It's hard to visualize. But we can't the the, the, the uh, ferocious nature uh, of those wounds uh, is. You know, people were vomiting and so on and so forth. But they, even for the physicians, it must have been uh, honestly shocking. Not, you know, you know, the physicians not going to cower or anything. Like that, but still, uh, still shocking. My dad was a surgeon, a urologist, and I've showed him, you know, uh, uh, attacked photos and things of that nature. He, he's long uh, gone now, but uh, he, he 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 thought they were absolutely gruesome. You know, the nature of a shark wound. It, it truly is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just looking through the Coppelson and, and Baldridge books. I mean, there's yeah. pictures of like, oh, Rodney Fox when he was attacked, and uh, yeah, you know, th just those attacks, just awful. You, you know, I don't know if I should reference books. I, I really shouldn't, but those, the ones we are mentioning, are a little bit toned down. Believe it or not, there oh. are other, there are other. I'll mention one name: Tim Wallet, W A L L. ETT. He, he, he did a, a you know, a, a book, you know, years ago in, in that same vicinity, it's even color, uh, color photos, but the, 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 it's, it's not for the squeamish. Let me tell you, it's really, uh, r really something. Some of those real life photos before the sutures, uh, before the stitching, which you're talking about with Fox. You know. So it's not a coffee table book is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it, yeah, it's not for, lighthearted yeah yeah so people after the second attack people are in panic mode uh i you mentioned woodrow wilson and and president at the time through the aftermath of these attacks i mean he even called his cabinet together i mean there was there was high level discussions about what to do with this shark problem that was plaguing the east coast and like i said you know there's all these theories about Oh my goodness! Like uh, uh, bombings and and how that disturbs underwater creatures and, and and things from the war and and there's all these different theories and everything. But before we get into that, there's more attacks. You know, days later, and and when I mentioned the Matawan Creek uh, at the at the top of the show, 
that's where the that's where the next attacks took place and it really these are heartbreaking for me um lester stillwell 11 years old uh he was killed in this creek when he's swimming with his friends and i, I have a 12 year old son and i just kind of look at him and his friends and i was picturing my gosh you know that these these boys have their whole lives ahead of them and here they are on a hot summer day at the local kind of swimming hole they had the afternoon off from from working at the the local mills and whatnot. And they're just having fun. They're just playing and tragedy happens uh, at, uh, at the Matawan Creek where you think of a pretty much a freshwater Creek. Yes, it's connected to the ocean, but, uh, but a freshwater Creek, you think that of all places to be safe other than a pool, it would be a, a Creek like that. And I've, and you've been to the, you've been to the Creek. Yeah. The, the irony of, uh, you, you know, you, what you mentioned in a, in a, in a place that should be kind of off limits to, uh, you know, any, uh, n- natural danger other than drowning or something like that. You would never expect it in a Creek and, and by ver- you know, simply by virtue of the fact that the kids were in the Creek, so to speak, they were, you know, perhaps of a, a little bit of a lower economic, uh, uh, level, you know, they didn't, they couldn't afford taking the train, say, to Asbury Park or Long Branch or one of the other uh, cities, you know, to go to the pool or the beach or something uh, along those lines. So there you have a, a certain uh, I- I- innocence about uh, about that and sympathy and, and whatnot. And, uh, and 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 sure, you have the Madawan Creek, uh, you know, it's attached to the Raritan Bay, Keyport Bay. You you go northward of, of Spring Lake now another thirty miles and you you come around Sandy Hook which is like our northern peninsula of the Jersey Shore uh, and uh, you would be entering the Bay Area there if you take a left turn and, uh, and and sure enough a a bark found its way into uh, the tidal creek uh, there on the incoming high tide and uh, you know the old sea captain was crossing the the trolley drawbridge near the mouth of the creek and, and sure enough, saw a shark, uh, you know, coming up the creek, uh, definitively, you know, went to, through the town and, uh, tried to warn people, uh, of its presence. Yeah. And that's a real dramatic part of your book. It's also a dramatic part of the made for, uh, shark week TV. movie that you, that was yeah. put together when Thomas Cottrell or Cottrell. You got it. Yes. Yeah. He's the old sea captain, like you said, and, and, He's seen sharks before and he spots this thing making its way up the creek. And I just, you know, in my mind, I just picture this guy running through the town and, and just just telling everybody and, and just telling everybody that this this shark, this creature and everybody's got shark fever anyway, is making its way up the creek. And he's kind of dismissed or ignored. What's he, what's this old guy talking about? And and before before too long, the, these boys who think they see like this old black or dark weather beaten board or like a weathered log floating in the water by him all of a sudden dorsal fin attack Lester Stillwell pulled underwater and and the boys you know skinny dipping back in 1916 get out of the creek and they run like hell back into town buck naked screaming looking for aid for help for their friend that was pulled underwater and the town responded yeah you know uh you know, I don't know necessarily if Matawan was primed for, uh, you know, shark craziness. Obviously, they heard about the other attacks, but yeah, they would never think in a million years. And and the 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 odd, rare nature of uh, a shark coming up the creek is confirmed essentially by Cottrell's reaction. You have an old salt like him. Uh, if he had ever, if he saw sharks in or around the creek before, he wouldn't have reacted like that. He thought it was a fairly large shark with such an odd uh, sight, that, you know, that he reacted uh, so uh, forcefully. He even uh, got a motorboat following his run uh, mm-hmm. to the phone and so on and so forth. He got a motorboat to try to warn uh, kids up and down uh, the creek from going in. So he was truly uh, aroused and concerned by the whole thing. But yeah, Lester was taken under, imagine his, uh, his f- friend's, uh, it, you know, how, how they would respond. But yeah, they thought they saw an old black weather beaten board or log kind of, you know, floating in the water uh, just prior to uh, him uh, getting attacked. And, you know, obviously he had no, he had no shot uh, against that, 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 that shark. Yeah. 
You know, so they run into town and these local businessmen, these local men come to help them out in any way they can, including Stanley Fisher, 24-year-old young man, uh, just starting off his his life, you know, a hardworking man with his new business. He and others dive right in there to find Lester Stillwell, sacrificing their own lives to, to go in and find this boy. They don't know if he's had an epileptic seizure or or what, if he hit his head, if he's just drowned. You know, they're the boys are are going crazy uh, about what they say happened. But these men jump in uh, without concern for their own safety. And Fisher is a real hero in all this. And one man that's with him gets grazed by the the sharp or, or the um, rough skin of a shark, and he's had enough. His chest is bleeding. He, he gets out of the water. And Stanley makes a dive down at the bottom to go find this young boy. And by by some accounts, he finds the boy or he raises up with him at some point, and then he is attacked. Ghastly. Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, it really is. Uh, it is made for the theater, honestly. I mean, because of uh, the, the characters you're uh, dealing with, you know, there's actually a book uh, just written, you know, it's written a couple of years ago. It's written solely about uh, Stanley Fisher's character. You know, the, the, as an individual, mm. you know, uh, he, he was, you know, real handsome, tall, athletic, but but a really uh, just a great, great uh, man, even though, he's, you know, only 24 years old, uh, but really, truly, truly well, well liked uh, in town. Everybody knew him and um, you know, he used to play baseball with the kids and so on and so forth. But, uh, yeah, he ran down there. They, they wanted at least to get Lester's body out of there. And, uh, but yeah, and, and, and they were getting cold and, 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 uh, Red Berlue, uh, actually, you know, you know, Arthur Van Buskirk was the, uh, or Arthur Smith was the one, uh, who got bumped, uh, or actually grazed very severely on the stomach area. And then, uh, but Red Berlue said he saw that shark coming around him and he just wanted to out. You know, none of us could say what we would do at the time, honestly, unless you're there. And he was just, I want out. And, uh. And Stanley took another dive. And, and there are more reports than there are not in reference to Stanley actually retrieving the body. And, and, and I think there's too many, uh, including the doctor, in reference to what Stanley repeated, that he did get a hold of, of, of that body. Don't know whether he necessarily got it away from the shark or not. Uh, it is still bot- that is possible. The shark was obviously there, you know. Uh, but yeah, Stanley was uh, nailed on his right thigh, very similar, but on the outer side compared to Charles Van Zandt, very, very sim- similar uh, contours and depth and uh, outcome to uh, uh, Stanley Fisher's wound compared to Charles Van Zandt down in Beach Haven. And uh, he just, you know, he was pulled around, but he was, you know, a strong man. He was able to punch the shark, kick it, punch it, punch it. And then these guys came over with a boat and started hitting, uh, hitting the water and the shark with boat oars. And it, it, it ultimately released, but no one was, you know, able, no one, no one was ready to necessarily get in the water. So they, they, they got, they, they sent him a rope and got him to the side of the dock, the wharf there. And uh, he, you know, felt around toward his leg, you know, and that, tea colored water, you know, and felt his leg. And he just felt that there was essentially nothing there. Essentially, what would you do? And, and he just said, oh, my God. And that's essentially the last thing Red Berlue heard him say. Yeah. I mean, he was severely injured and he bled to death on the way to the hospital uh, after they pulled him out. There's all these um, great photos um, in your book, too. All these historical photos of people. I don't know if some of them were staged at the time or not, but like people with standing on the banks of the creek with guns, shooting them into the water, just hoping to kill this monster that they they thought was was haunting their their creek there. And and then one part of your book that it just made me so sad. It's it's when Lester Stillwell's body, the eleven year old boy's body, surfaced two days later. It 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 was found two days later upstream from from that dock area where where he was attacked. And a gentleman, you know, pulled this mutilated corpse out of out of the water and hand delivered like delivered Lester's body to his folks. Yeah, yeah, it, it's you, you, you know you can't you can't make this stuff up. But yeah, two days uh, later, you know when the uh, 
you know, the gas is more or less built up and whatever was remaining of his tissues, essentially he was mutilated on every aspect of his limbs and his, uh, and, you know, his intestines were unfortunately, uh, gone and hanging out and, uh, his face and his head was, uh, fortunately untouched, but yeah, the, uh, train, uh, conductor, uh, you know, was walking along the tracks and saw him under the, uh, trestle mm-hmm. overpass, uh, floating there, a uh, pale and nude, I suppose. And, uh, but that same morning, that's the, uh, well, you know, I, I won't skip to that, but that same morning there was a, uh, a shark, uh, caught, but, uh, we haven't touched on the, the, the final attack, but yeah, they, they got Lester wrapped him in blanket. Uh, brought him to, you know, in those days, right? You know, they brought him to his mom at the house and she fainted and all that kind of stuff. In reference to that conductor, you know, I interviewed his daughter, you know, obviously years later, and she said he, he her dad would never, ever, ever talk about it. Hmm. You know, that, that episode, never. She only learned about it through the papers, believe it or not. He would never talk, but that's, you know, that's how it goes. Almost similar to a, a war experience, something along those lines. Oh, sure. I mean, I, the, 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 the stress or the, the post-traumatic stress of, of seeing that. Especially a child. Oh, yeah. absolutely. That's, it, it's yeah. so ghastly. And then I think about, you know, in your book, like uh, the, the, the shark down at the bottom and, and when Fisher goes down to go retrieve the body and the shark was probably down there feeding on the, on the body in that dark murky water. It's just, it's just such a, it's no wonder that people are talking about this, you know, over a hundred years later, but you didn't mention the fifth and final victim, um, Joseph Dunn. He was, he was 14 and he was attacked just a little bit later that same day, about a half a mile away from, from where the fatal attacks on Stillwell and Fisher were. Yeah. Westward, uh, supposedly or apparently, or in my opinion, likely, you know, as the, the, the tide started to go out, the shark had enough of that environment and, uh, went, uh, eastward, you know, back toward the bay when it got to around where the, uh, Garden State Parkway, uh, now comes over, uh, the Creek area. Uh, there had been an old, a brickyard there and, uh, and a couple of kids had come down from Brooklyn and they were, playing with some other local kids and you know by this time you know mothers and so on and so were screaming for their kids you know to get out of the creek and and the last one that got get to the dock ladder was the youngest the uh, you know a 12 year old uh joseph dunn and he was uh, struck on the left the uh, lower leg around the calf and the front of the shin area and the foot uh, you know pretty severely and it was uh his brother and uh, and another kid uh, and and the uh, the brickyard attendant I mean, literally with a, through a tug of war yanked him out of the shark's mouth. Without them there, he he you know he would be the fifth uh, death. Uh, but they got him out, and he spent two months in the hospital. Captain Cottrell actually took him with the motorboat over to the White Cough Dock, the original wharf area, and you know they took him by car uh, to a St. Peter's Hospital. Like I say, he spent two months, got a skin graft. I uh, doubt they had antibiotics in those days, obviously, but antiseptics and so on and so forth. But uh, or, yeah, miraculous, but he did survive. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the way you write about it in your book, I mean, they're, they're literally, he, he himself, Joseph Dunn later even said that like he, they, th- it felt like they were pulling him right out of the shark's throat. Yeah. He thought he, he thought he was definitely going to be swallowed, that it actually wanted to consume him. Yeah. And they, uh, they yanked it out. You know, there's a dullness, believe it or not. Uh, apparently, it's more of a pressure, like a squeeze, uh, apparently, than it is, you know, like you're being sliced in half or something like that. So, yeah, he felt that. And, uh, you know, fortunately, he survived. Yeah, shocky, but yeah, brave and, and uh, fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. And they thought what's strange is like when there's these attacks happen. And I read it with, um, I think it was Bruder. I think it was Bruder when they, he was saying, you know, the shark got me, got my legs. The pain of you, you think that you would have of having your, you know, flesh ripped off your bones severed and broken by this uh, man eating shark. You think there'd be so much just unbearably uh, insane pain that you would be feeling the, the speculation at the time was that, well, perhaps the shark's teeth have some kind of toxin that deadens the pain or something like that. But with your medical uh, expertise and background, 
you were explaining, and you can do it better than I can, but you were explaining just like the traumatic loss, the sudden loss of blood and things like that, that would make up for the the perceived lack of of pain from from such a traumatic event. Yeah, and uh, you, you know the, the the sharp nature to a a, a shark's uh, teeth, uh, you know, can combine, I suppose, to uh, you know to diminish the, the the intensity. It's not like a, a it's not like a sledgehammer hitting you necessarily, but it probably goes beyond that. Uh, there's probably a, a, a an automatic uh, nerve deadening through you know certain. Uh, technical and complicated channels where we don't necessarily feel it in that sense. And believe it or not, it's probably not the just sharks and it's probably not just humans either. It's probably all, uh, most animals, not even just mammals, uh, terrestrial animals when they're being, uh, I'm sorry to say attacked by a larger predator, whether it's a bear or a lion or a tiger, uh, the, the, they, you know, they say it's a, the, it's the benevolence of our creator to allow that you almost get like a morphine type of a shocky effect where it's simply a pressure. And in fact, there's a guy attacked by an alligator yesterday, the day before searching for uh, fossil teeth in, in uh, Florida. And he was attacked in the head, believe it or not. He, he survived it, but he said he didn't feel the pricking of the alligator's teeth. He just felt like a squeeze uh, on, on, it, on his head. You know, he, he required a lot of stitches. You know, it was very light. It actually had a fractured skull. Uh, so it's something about predator and prey. And, and unfortunately, we're the prey in this particular discussion. Yeah, there's a scene in a movie with Liam Neeson. I don't know if you've seen the movie called The Gray. It came out about 10 years ago. Yes. The, the wolf movie. There's a scene where a guy, uh, he breaks his legs falling down some trees. Spoiler, in case nobody, in case you haven't seen out there, listeners. I've seen it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the, one of the guys uh, uh, breaks his legs and then he's, he, he's attacked by a wolf and, and his brain kind of, like you said, kind of leaves the situation, uh, the reality of the situation. And the, the fur of the wolf kind of reminds him of the gentle caress of the hair of his daughter or something like that. And <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you apparently go into like a dreamy state. Yeah. The benevolence. Yeah, yeah, of our creator. But it's, uh, and uh, yeah, that, 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 that's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your life passing before your eyes. So the, the whole community is going shark crazy now. And the fishermen, there's bounties just like in the movie. Uh, Jaws, there's there's rewards for the, the capture of these man eaters. And so that really sparks its own kind of little cottage industry of, fishermen uh, uh, going after wrangling sharks, but also people going out opportunist, opportunistic people going out to purchase sh shark corpses and charging money for people to come view the man eater, the, the New Jersey man eater, so to speak. So th there's a uh, panic and rewards and shark fishermen and everything. And so there's, there's different theories about where the shark ended up. Perhaps it was caught. Uh, the most intriguing story is the one, uh, the Charles Slicer, uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's the former Barnum and Bailey lion tamer who caught a great white shark. And there was, there was human remains of some form in the stomach of the shark when it was dissected. Yeah. So that morning that the Lester Stillwell floated up there in the Creek, uh, Michael Slicer, you know, I, I I asked. Uh, I guess it's it's Austrian, German, Austrian. I I don't know the. I, I forget the exact pronunciation, but neither of us is right. Um, <laughs> 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 but it's like Schleiser or something like that. Right. But in any event, Michael Schleiser was a, you know a lion tamer, taxidermist of some regard. You know, worked uh, for the uh, Museum of Natural History in, in American Museum of Natural History in New York and other venues, including the Barnum and Bailey Circus and all that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, he took a small motorboat out there into the Raritan Bay and was about four miles from the mouth of the creek uh, at some point with a drift net down. And, and he snagged into uh, a shark, uh, turned out to be a seven and a half uh, foot, <clears throat> 350 pound uh, juvenile, a great white shark. And uh, they clubbed it. It almost took the boat under. It was an eight foot motorboat, almost took the boat under. And they clubbed that. Uh, got it to a dock and then ultimately got it back to their launch point. And he got that animal uh, back to his house in the Bronx and 
stuffed it in whatever a manner was uh, appropriate for the day. And, uh, and, and sure, just like the other opportunists uh, you, you mentioned, so to speak, uh, you know, there was, it was a lot of hoopla, uh, uh, you know, surrounding sharks. They put them in corral fences and have them at hotels and all sorts of places for exhibit uh, all over the place. And, you know, you'd go to a fish market, I suppose, or your local dock and try to get one of these one of these dead sharks and 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 make some money off the ticket sales and that kind of thing. I guess it was good in reference to exposure for sharks. It wasn't good for the shark population. But, yeah, the biggest uh, man, um, you know, uh, hunt for uh, a man eating uh, shark was on, you know, killed a lot of sharks horribly. Uh, you know, it was one of probably the, one of the biggest uh, focused uh, animal hunts probably in history, uh, you know, at that time. Probably everywhere, and, you know, not, not just New Jersey, probably in, in, in New York and uh, Massachusetts and, you know, other, uh, uh, other areas. Uh, but uh, New Jersey, for sure, a lot of uh, sharks were slaughtered. But Schleiser shark is the only one with uh, verified uh, human remains. Uh, and, you know, and the corroborating scientists were were notable in reference to the identification of this animal as a great white shark. Uh, uh, Dr. Lucas from the American Museum and then the anatomist uh, Frederick Lucas is the one who confirmed that the bones at least were uh, human. Uh, so, you, you, had, you know, pretty high level guys confirming that, although they were not on the dock when all this happened. So it doesn't go that far. Sure. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, this was 1916. So there was no, obviously no DNA analysis, nothing like that. But, but the experts at the time did examine the contents of the shark stomach and determine that they were, uh, human in nature. So at least at some, you know, through your book, you are very good about putting out the different hypothesis and the different theories and the different you know, looking at it this way, well, then let's turn it around and look at it this way. So I know there's no way to uh, conclusively say it was this shark or it was that shark, or it was a combination of sharks, but you really let the reader go through all this painstakingly researched information uh, to come up with kind of our own thoughts and feelings or, or, or our own conclusions, or just to kind of speculate about it. So the book is fantastic. It's almost like three books in one. It's it's like it's like a historical account. It's this uh, tragic story of American history, and then it's very scientific, especially towards the end. And I, I really enjoyed every single part of of what you put together there. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. That that was my objective. You know, I don't want to have egg on my face one day. You know, if they do, uh, I'm sorry to say morbidly, if they do exhume one or more of those bodies and, and protect, uh, potentially, you know, come up with a species or for at least one of uh, the victims. Uh, but the, sure, I try to lay out uh, you know, objectively as a scientific or as a scientific aspect of that, you know, section of the book or that aspect, uh, you know, give it to, uh, you know, you know, the reader to come up with uh, how they feel about it. the only thing I and, I and I and I'm happy to hear all opinions, even yours. I, I can tell you're a little bit reserved. You don't want to insult me about uh, opposing opinions, maybe. <laughs> but I'm happy to hear. I'm all good. Yeah, I'm happy to hear all <laughs> opposing sides. The only thing I don't like about uh, getting into a debate about anything is if someone uh, is uh, using an error in reference to supporting uh, what they might be saying. But uh, in reference to that the great white shark of uh, Michael Schleiser's, uh, the mere, regardless of the uh, gory aspect of the human remains, which is significant alone, especially if it's uh, authentic, uh, the, the fact that they capture a great white shark uh, alone, uh, and especially where they caught it, is very, is very significant. The only one of, of that speech that they got and it happened to be, you know, in that, in that vicinity in, in a Bay area. Uh, so it, it, it's not, you know, it, you know, people talk about the bull shark. I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, but you can't diminish that, uh, that aspect. Some, some, some experts, especially if they're a proponent of the bull shark aspect, they always say, Oh, well, um, you know, they caught a, they caught a shark a few days later. And, um, you know, if they didn't, it could have been any shark. If they didn't get that, we wouldn't even talk about the great white, some, you know, something along those, the fact is they did get one. 
Right. Uh, so, you know, that's the, that's the issue. You yeah. know, let's accept the fact that they did catch that shark and it did yeah. have human remains in it. So we'll put that as part of the, as part of the, uh, yeah. investigation, the evidence, and the, evidence yeah. sure. and the analyst. Yeah. And, I, and I understand why people want to, uh, go down the, the bull shark route, bull shark. Sure. You know, it almost sure. Sound like Absolutely. A, yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised one day, honestly, if it's, it's one bull shark that did all of the attacks, I'd be surprised. I said I wouldn't be surprised, but I wouldn't be. I'm, I'm leaving it as an option for for sure, you know. But uh, there's reason to. I have reason to believe that, you, you know. Uh, I'm still leaning, not just for dramatic reasons. That's part of it, you know. Choosing the great white shark. You know, something's gonna you're gonna pin someone a shark. You better you know pick the uh, the king of shark, you know. Right. Uh, but uh, no, I have other reasons to. Uh, B- believe it. One one thing we you can't uh, un- underestimate is the fact that the Matawan Creek was probably twice twice the depth, three times the depth. It was dredged in those days uh, for actual steamers to come in there. It was a high tide, and uh, I think we're growing. The evidence is growing that great juvenile great whites definitely uh, concentrate at times in bays. Believe it or not, and uh, so it is within the realm of possibility. Uh, I believe that, you know, that that could have been the species and the individual. Yeah. Oh, sure. And, you know, and, and experts and theorists point to the fact that, you know, a bull shark can survive in, in fresh water, um, especially like, you know, the, the documented cases like in Lake Nicaragua and things like that. That's laid out very, uh, very thoroughly in your book. But the the um, saline content of the water, uh, Matawan Creek at the time, especially with high tide and, and things like that, it they caught a shark with human remains in it. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, they didn't actually catch it in the creek. You know, it was no. in the bay just outside the creek. And right. it was a moon tide. It was a, you know, it was a two days before or after full moon. So it was also a swollen uh, tide. But, uh, you know, on that subject, I, I, I have, you know, one expert said to me, the only way to figure out where the great white shark could do it is actually to throw it in the creek and see if it survives. That's not uh, actually uh, an answer because there's so much more impervious surface. To, there was no impervious surface back then. So much more impervious surface, say, with the freshwater rain runoff. The, the creek is fully, uh, you know, strangled with sediment. So you can't do that. The only thing we can do is is study these satellite, the satellite tagging and all the evidence we're gaining. We're gaining so, so much information on the migratory patterns of uh, the juveniles and the adults and, and, and see where they head and so on and so forth. I do have to went, mention one study came out on May 3rd in the uh, Environmental Biology of Fishes, believe it or not, it was concentrated in the Mosul Bay in South Africa, just uh east of Cape Town, and they did a study just on Bay Great White Shark uh, sightings and so on and so forth. And they found that there were no, they found three, they they had 3,000 sightings. Not one was an adult. They were all juvenile uh, great white sharks up to 3.1 meters, which is the size of the uh, Schleicer uh, seven and a half footer, uh, which would be three, which would be three meters. and, uh, you know, close, you know, in that, in that, in just under that vicinity and those sharks they found, which I actually alluded to it in, in, in my, in my book, which is well before this study that these juvenile sh- sh- white sharks are actually practicing on different prey items, uh, in an environment that's away from the competitive, larger white sharks. So these younger white sharks hang in the bays to stay away from the larger ones and they practice going after a turtle, seal, uh, a, a, this large fish, a that. Uh, and and, and that ex- was exactly my contention. Even back at my first crack at this, that if it's a white shark, if that was you know, juvenile uh, white shark, it was in that transitional phase, trying to figure out when or how to go for larger prey items, you know, going from they go for sea robins. They go for little fish when they're really babies, and they got to go to a transition, start competing for the l- larger protein-rich, uh, fatty-rich foods, and so on and so. So I believe it's in that you know transitional uh, phase. And regard in relation to that topic, I believe this is ju- this is just me without scientific evidence for it, but I, I believe that it actually makes sense that those white sharks actually potentially have a 
they call a Yuri Hayline uh, potential. And that's where, uh, you know, you stingrays and, uh, and sawfish and striped bass and sturgeon and all those kind of, of fish can actually spend a certain amount of time in a much lower salinity, you know, in the brackish environments and so on and so forth. And I wouldn't doubt that the juvenile great white is, is has a certain capacity to do that uh, as well. And that's where, you know, this, it doesn't want to hang out in a tidal creek, no, but and it's going to survive in there for an hour. I'm saying, yes, that, that's what I'm going at. Oh my gosh. That's frightening. <laughs> well, but it's such a rare, 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 rare thing, you know, uh, obviously. Yeah. You know? I was just thinking about these juvenile great whites and like some kind of a training ground training day. I mean, they're all the, I know. Right. Right. Like soldiers, gladiators. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, now you're, you're from New Jersey and you're living there yes. now. Uh, now, as the anniversary comes and goes every year, do is it remarked? Is it is it ever? You know, what's the, what's the feeling of the community these years later? I mean, I know I, I go to YouTube and I watch people like paddle boat on the on the Matawan Creek, showing people like me that live in Nebraska uh, <laughs> where these attacks happened. You know, a hundred years later, but yeah. But yeah. do people kind of forget it or like, or is it kind of like buried local history or, or is it not, I don't want to say celebrated, but I mean, is it remarked? Is it, is it? No. Well, if you want your answer, you might've heard of the magazine Weird New Jersey. Um, it's yeah, it, it has a lot of history in it so-called and, and, and different events, uh, certain, and, and it, it, it was a primary story, uh, for them this year. And this is 2021. In 2016, it was the 100th anniversary. We had, you know, talks and events and, you know, but in reference to how it's regarded, no, it's still not, um, a lot more people know about it for sure. But no, it still generates a lot of curiosity. And it's such a rare thing. We do not have deadly or serious shark attacks in New Jersey. You know, yeah, sure, one could happen tomorrow and, you know, and, 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 you know, it'll be a big payday for my book, right? But <laughs> seriously, uh, it, it, it's such a rare thing that we can actually discuss it uh, in this capacity. I'm not talking. You know, I'm, I'm not. We're not speaking nostalgically necessarily, but we're speaking about the history, the context, the scientific aspect. But it's such a rare event that we we can explore it even during the summer. It, the, the topic can don't don't. Don't get me wrong, it can sensitize an individual. You start reading about these different attack sequences or even the, just the 1960 attack. You can be sensitized to topic, and, and that should not uh, happen. It, you know, it could generate a phobia for yourself. That's not the objective at all. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said at the beginning of the program, to have you and the author of this, this definitive account of this horrific event in American history, an important Amer event in American history, right before World War I, to have you on the program and to, you know, share this hour with you to, to dive into this, this topic has been a real treat for me. Uh, like I said, I enjoyed your book thoroughly. Uh, I've been reading about sharks and shark attacks since I was a, since I was a kid. And I really, from the moment I started reading your book and got through it the first time, I was so just so impressed with everything about it. It, it really is the definitive account. And I know it's available on Amazon because that's where I got it. But do you, do you sell it other places? I mean, do you have a, a, a website that you... No, I honestly don't have a website, but Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, your local bookstore even uh, may have it. 12 Days of Terror. have a, you know, a, new, a, 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 a new preface and a new... Uh, a uh, colorful front page, you know, in the 2016 centennial edition, which is very nice paperback. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I'm proud of that. And um, yeah, it, it, like I say, I think it's a, a very good source, you know, at least for the scientific uh, and historical aspects of the story. And, you know, people can read other dramatized versions. Uh, you know, there are several others, uh, but, you know, I like to stick to the facts because, you know, real people did die and and they were heroic, uh, even, uh, you know, just from the facts. So I like to always highlight uh, the reality. Yeah. 
thank you so much for being a part of the program and my very best to you. And, and thank you so much for not only spending the time with me, but for spending all the time with the, with the families of the deceased and everybody that you interviewed for the book. I mean, page after page of, of painstaking, like I said, research went into this book and I can tell it's just such, it's just so full of great information and just fascinating and compelling and, and having you on the program, like I said, it's just been a real a real treat, and I thank you so much for being a part of the show tonight. Thank you so much, Brian, and thanks for your great uh, life of preparation and, and, and reading all the other books that I uh, enjoyed as well. It's a real treat for me to speak to someone uh, with that kind of background as well. And thanks for having me. Yeah. There we go, everybody. That was Dr. Richard G. Fernicola on the Necronomicast. All about his book, 12 Days of Terror, The New Jersey Shark Attacks of 1916. I've wanted to put that show together and talk about those shark attacks for a long time. And I'm so glad that he was able to get through his busy schedule and everything. I mean, the guy's a doctor. I mean, he's got patience. He had patience that day we did the show, did the conversation. He's got patience today. And he had a lot of patience talking to me. Ha ha. Next up on the Necronomicast, it's still Shark Month here. We're going to have Dr. Another Doctor, but this one's Dr. Mike Heithaus. He's a professor at Florida International University, one of the world's leading ichthyologists. We're going to talk about the different man-eaters that are out there. We're going to talk about different shark attacks, the behavior of sharks. We're going to go through our top three man-eaters. So you don't want to miss that on episode 205 of the Necronomicast. It's shark month, so as you drive around, fly around on vacation, thanks for listening to the Necronomicast. Hope you're enjoying this shark programming. This episode was copyright... 2021, all rights reserved, recorded in beautiful Omaha, Nebraska, about as far away from a shark or from the ocean as you can get. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great day. Get some sleep.